Amen. Please turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 39. Genesis chapter 39. Uh, two weeks ago in our sermon series, uh, Genesis 37, we saw ten of the sons of Jacob, or, or the sons of Israel, had some part in capturing and or selling their brother Joseph away as a slave. And Joseph went from being the favored son, the son who wore that uh, beautiful I am the chosen son and the one who will inherit the double portion coat of many colors. He went from being that to being the slave of a man named Potiphar, a government official in the land of Egypt. Uh, Last week we saw in Genesis 38 the beginning of the line of Judah, uh, the story of Judah and Tamar, how God providentially worked through a myriad (laughs) of man's wrong actions to start the family line that would bring about the kings of Israel. Uh, And of course, that includes the king of kings, King Jesus the Christ. Uh, We also got to see a man humbled. The Lord used the events, the sinful actions in Genesis 38 to bring Judah to a turning point, a turning point in his life, where he began to respect people. He began to love people. Uh, to give of himself sacrificially for the benefit of another, uh, which is exactly what we see Jesus Christ, what he did for us when he died in our place at the cross. Uh, So now, uh, Genesis 39, it's time to go back to the narrative of Joseph and then therefore back down to Egypt. Uh, When Joseph traveled to Egypt as a slave, as you think of him going down there in the caravan, seeing the sights as he arrives, uh, it is during the 12th, dynasty. This was a high point of what's called the Middle Kingdom, uh, which historians believe was the most successful, the most powerful period in the history of Egypt. And so Joseph is going to a place where the people have become very successful. Uh, They would have perceived themselves uh, as a wonderful society, superior, certainly superior to those uh, Hebrews from Canaan. Uh, The king, Pharaoh, was powerful, uh, and they were busy serving their gods, Uh, They would have had no place for neglecting the worship of their gods, who they would have seen as being the reason for the blessing they had. They wouldn't have put them aside in favor of this God of the Hebrews. Of course not. Uh, Especially considering the fact that he had allowed his young man here to become a slave of theirs. This would have just been another sign of the superiority of their people, the superiority of their gods in their mind. And so Joseph is away from home. He's in a foreign land. He's in a place where no one believes the way that he does. He has a different set of standards uh, of what is right and wrong than everybody else around him seems to have. And he has to balance having to answer to and serve this unbelieving boss while also striving to be pleasing to the Lord. Anybody else feel that struggle? Does this scenario sound familiar uh, to anyone this morning? An unbelieving boss unbelieving co-workers, different sets of standards, and you're trying to do the right thing in the midst of it all because you know that whatever we do, God is the final judge, and we want to glorify and be pleasing to him. That can be a tough place to be in, can it? Uh, With what so many of us do throughout the week, uh, those of us in the workforce, students in public schools and colleges, thinking about all of this makes James 127 hit a little closer to home. Uh, James 127 says this, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. Uh, First, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, meaning to to help those who cannot help themselves or or would be able to repay you, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. To keep oneself unstained from the world. Uh, Christians, remember, this world is not our home. And there is a battle being waged in this world. The little, the little G God of this world is fighting a losing battle against the big G, capital G, God of the universe. But while that battle rages, one of the evidences that we are staying on task in our mission is that we're keeping ourselves unstained from the world. We keep ourselves unstained not by casting our eyes on the world, but by actively pursuing and obeying our champion, Jesus Christ. Let me give you a few illustrations. Uh, This week, Albert Pujols, 
Albert Pujols hit his 700th career home run. Uh, sorry for people who aren't sports fans. I'm going to talk sports for a second. 700th career home run. Only four men have ever done that before, and, and three of them weren't using performance-enhancing trucks. <coughs> but do you think that Albert Pujols should go to a guy who's never hit a single home run, who misses the ball every time he swings, and watch his batting tutorials on YouTube to try to, to, try to improve upon his own swing? That's not like a good idea? Do you think that Albert Pujols should let that terrible hitter's swinging style rub off on him? I say, well, no. What if uh, Luciano Pavarotti, the famous opera singer, what if he went to a kid who got kicked out of middle school choir because he was tone deaf and his voice still cracked? What if Pavarotti had gone to that kid and said, teach me? It's a time. Would Pavarotti had had any success if that tone deaf adolescent's singing style had rubbed off on him. When I was in the fifth grade, third, third story, when I was in the fifth grade, I ran to be my elementary school's student council vice president. I ran for vice president. For, for whatever reason, I must not have felt that I was ready for the top job yet. I was probably, though, mostly concerned with losing recess time. So vice president it was. But if you can believe it, I lost. I lost. Yeah, still hurts, no, not really. <laughs> I lost an elementary school student council vice presidential election. Now just the timing of this, I, no, no political affiliation, just the timing of when it was. When, what if then governor of Arkansas, Bill Clinton, had come up to Ohio to ask me to help him run his presidential election? I probably would have made a lot of Republicans happy back then. Uh, President Bush would have had a second term. But my campaign strategies were pretty weak. Uh, the uh, Andy Molino for vice president sign that my mom helped me make, that was pretty sweet. But that's about all I did. That was all I did. It would have been pretty ridiculous for a sitting governor to think that the losing ways of a fifth grade kid uh, were going to help him in any way win a presidential election. Uh, so we think about these things. Presidents or politicians shouldn't ask kids who lose their elections and student council how to run a great campaign. Although that does sound better maybe than the, what's going on. But on beyond that, professional opera singers, they don't need any tips from kids who got cut from middle school choir. Hall of Fame baseball players don't need any pointers from YouTubers who couldn't hit a slow pitch softball to save their life. Christians, Satan is defeated and those who reject Christ will be judged. We don't need to learn their ways, and we don't have to bow to their wills. We are to remain unstained by the world. Their ways don't need to be rubbing off on us. Jesus has won the victory for us. In his death, in his resurrection, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him, and he is coming again to rule and reign. Let's do things his way. Amen? Uh, all of this leads up to what we're about to read today. Joseph is going to find himself in some difficult situations. And by God's grace, he's going to persevere. He's going to do things God's way. Uh, so let's take a look and see how that happens. And uh, God is going to use every hardship, every one of these burdens, every temptation, and every apparent setback God's going to use all of these things to keep working and moving Joseph toward where he needs to be. Not a setback, but moving him toward where he needs to be. So as we read Genesis 39, let's see how God continues to work providentially in the life of Joseph. And let's see how Joseph serves the Lord in the midst of an unbelieving people. So Genesis chapter 39, starting in verse 1. Uh, now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt. That ca catches us back into the right narrative here. Joseph had brought, uh, been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. Uh, this Potiphar, a man who worked in the government for Pharaoh, was the man whom Joseph served. But we know this. There was another more powerful master who was leading and ministering to and through uh, Joseph. 
In Colossians chapter 3, verses 22 through 24, we see this instruction. It says, Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service, not just to be pleasing to man, but uh, not as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord, not man, but fearing the Lord. And, and this is for all of us. Verse 23, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. This was true for Joseph and is true for all of us, no matter where we work. Isn't that good news? Uh, whether you're at uh, an office, a construction site, uh, a school building, at home, uh, working from home, uh, taking care of your children, Whatever it is that God has given you to do to serve and to work and to strive, you are working first for the Lord, no matter where you are. That clarifies things for us, doesn't it? It gives us a compass by which to navigate our day. Uh, verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph. A key phrase that we're going to see here with Joseph in, in the home of Potiphar and later. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. And he was in the house of, the, uh, of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. And he, Potiphar, made him Joseph, overseer of his house, and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house why? For Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had, in house and field. Uh, remember, God said to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you. And then verse 6 says, So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. So the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. Uh, notice, too, that every time we see the Lord, if you're looking in your Bible, uh, the word Lord in these verses, it's L-O-R-D in all capital letters. That, that is, in English translations, uh, that means that it's the uh, name, the given name of God, uh, pronounced either Yahweh or Jehovah. Uh, this is the covenant name, the personal name revealed by God for his people to use. So this is very important. The very successful and powerful Egyptian people who have their own gods and have no interest in the God of these terrible Hebrew people. What does Potiphar realize? Who does he know is doing this? Verse 3 says this, his master Potiphar saw that the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed, uh, to, give, to give success in his hands. God's faithfulness to Joseph and Joseph's faithful and diligent service to Potiphar made Potiphar see that the Lord, the true God, was the one blessing him. That's pretty big. That's a big deal. Joseph's hard work and excellent work was being used by God as a witness in this foreign land before this foreign dignita dignitary. Uh, take heart, Christians. In your workplace, there are a myriad of ways that you can show Christ to your employers, to your employees, to your co-workers. Uh, this must have also been an important thing, uh, an encouragement to Joseph, who, remember, had been taken away from his home in the promised land and taken down to a foreign land, down to Egypt. If he didn't know it already, he was learning firsthand that the Lord is not restricted to a certain area of the world. He's not restricted he is the creator and Lord of all. And the Lord was with Joseph, even in Egypt. Um, as God had told Jacob before he left the promised land for Haran in Genesis 28, 15, God said, behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. So God's not restricted to just Israel. He can exercise his sovereignty in Egypt just fine. And God is not confined, confined to the walls of this church building. He goes with you to your job site, to your home, and everywhere else you go as well. Um, so do you think 
Joseph here in this situation, a follower of God, do you think he ever wondered, why do I even go to work? Look at my life. What about my dreams where I'm supposed to be like in charge and stuff? And I'm a slave. I'm in a foreign land. Nobody sees things the way I see things as far as God is concerned. What, what am I doing here? Why should I try so hard? Uh, why is my life just wasting away working for this Egyptian? And yet, it can be even the little things, like Potiphar taking care of his own food, the little things that make unbelievers take notice of what we're doing, uh, which points them to what God is doing. And, and here's what I mean by that. In the middle of verse 6 where it says, nothing but the food he ate, that's all Potiphar had left to deal with. Where it says that, it's possible that the reason why Joseph didn't oversee Potiphar's food is because of the relig religious ritual preparation uh, that would have been part of their diet. Uh, meaning Joseph abstained from the worship of the Egyptian gods in such a way that he did not participate with what would have been happening to that food that was put on Potiphar's plate. So Potiphar had to take care of that himself. Does that make sense? It was a testimony. Uh, sort of like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and the Babylonian captivity when they chose to eat a different diet to remain faithful to the Lord. It is that kind of stuff that makes us stick out that identifies us differently in the minds of others. Now, whether it's the way we do our work while we're on the clock, uh, that can differentiate us from other people, how we conduct ourselves after work or at lunch when everybody else is going off and doing these other things, or even when you get asked on Monday, what'd you do this weekend? And part of your answer is, I went to church. If we are following Jesus, and making it our ambition to be pleasing to him in everything we do, before long, we're going to stick out. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Those are opportunities. I, I'd encourage you, even with, if somebody asks you at work tomorrow, what'd you, guys, what'd you do this weekend? And, and you might be even tempted in that moment to think of all of the normal things that you did that weekend. Uh, we went uh, camping, or we went to the kids' uh, ball game, or we'd you know, we uh, went out to eat, da -da -da -da, all, the, all the things that go, oh yeah, me too. <laughs> that may be an opportunity for you, yes? We went to church. Here's what we learned about at church. Whoop, that's great, see you later, <laughs> right? <laughs> Those are opportunities for us. And it's good to stick out. We are different, aren't we? Um, so everything was going quite well for Joseph, it seemed, uh, and therefore for Potiphar also, and we know this, until it wasn't. Until it wasn't. Let's pick up, uh, back up towards the end of verse 6. We stopped before this phrase. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Uh-oh. Right? <laughs> now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He's not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph, it says then, day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her or to be with her. Uh, the idea being that day after day, day after day, she would ask him for slightly different things, trying to get him to cave. One day she might ask him to make love to her. The next day she might say, just, let's just spend some time alone together, me and you. And his response, day after day, no. No. We think of Joseph and how life was going in that house. Joseph had been successful. Uh, it was obvious from a, from a human perspective in Potiphar's home that he, Joseph, was the reason why things were going so well. He was growing in influence and power in the house. People listened to him. They took orders from him. He had everyone's respect, including Potiphar. He, he must have also spoken well 
and, and showed proper respect to other people. Uh, for Potiphar just to entrust his entire estate to him that way, not, to not worry whether jo- Joseph was going to try to usurp him. He respected people. It was apparent. He must have treated people well, uh, not coming across like he was up to something or only for himself. He looks like he was a, uh, an honest, sincere, servant-hearted man and leader. And from what it says in verse 9, people in the house treated him with the same level of respect that they gave to Potiphar. It's pretty amazing. And he was really handsome. Uh, the last time we see the Bible using these words to describe someone's physical appearance was with Rachel, Joseph's mother, in uh, Genesis 29, 17. So evidently he got his good looks from his mother. Um, so Joseph was successful. He was respected. He was handsome. Potiphar's wife notices all these things. Uh, Joseph was also still very young. He's a young man. Uh, at this point, he would have been about 18 years old, we think, uh, which makes his success quite remarkable. And some might say also his resolve to say no in the face of this temptation. Uh, but be encouraged, young people. Don't let anybody s- despise your youth. 18 years old, 21 years old, every other years old, Uh, we are able to follow hard after the Lord and have victory over temptation. We're able, by God's grace. Uh, Now, Potiphar's wife, have you ever wondered why the Bible doesn't tell us her name? Always Potiphar's wife, his wife, my master's wife. My guess is uh, because in this narrative, and morally, what mattered and what needed to matter to Joseph was that this woman was covenanted and united together with another man. That's the most important part of what we need to know about her. Okay? Joseph told her, you are his wife. The only woman that Joseph ever needed to be intimate with is the woman to whom he could say one day, you are my wife. That's it. Uh, Ephesians 5.3 says, uh, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. But Potiphar's wife was a privileged woman, married to a powerful man, with servants all around fulfilling her every request. Uh, My guess is that she wasn't used to being told no. Not something she was used to. Joseph is a slave. He's to do what he's told. Uh, But he answered to two higher authorities than Potiphar's wife, didn't he? Uh, First Potiphar and the Lord. Joseph desired to do the right thing by Potiphar, and Joseph desired to do the right thing by the Lord. Um, he could have slept with her, with Potiphar's wife, in the hopes of, of, of the instant physical pleasure. Maybe perhaps beyond that, another boost in his profile, if she would conceal what had occurred and, and speak highly of him, kind of like a, an I'll do this for you if you do this for me kind of a deal. According to uh, Kent Hughes, sexual promiscuity was a daily part of slavehold. Uh, households. This was a time-honored political strategy. This could have been seen as good for Joseph's future in, in the twisted ways of the world. And he could have feared. He could have feared. So he could have seen the potential benefits to himself in this, and he could have also been afraid. What if I say no? What will this immoral, selfish woman do if I say no? How could that hurt my place in this house? What if she hates me for saying no and does something to hurt me or to get me in trouble? But to Joseph, what had to be true is that whatever she might do in response to this, his decision, it didn't matter because his ambition was to be pleasing to God. To God. Okay, he also writes this, It's a good summary statement here of this passage. It says, in short, Joseph refused to sin against A, the trust given him, B, the woman's husband, and C, God himself. Joseph's integrity was of one fabric, not isolated instances. It all goes together, one fabric. And because he was faithful in all relationships, he could resist being unfaithful in this instance. 
This story is not just about sexual fidelity. Joseph li- Joseph's life was a web of moral accountability. He saw his moral life as a unified, integrated whole. I hope you hear and hear as I read this quote, this is, this is an answer for us. How do I fight this? How do I uh, have the ability and, and the love in my heart for other people to say no in these times of temptation? He saw his moral life as a unified, integrated whole. His overall faithfulness had helped him reject the massive temptation. And we must understand that little sins pave way to big sins and that Joseph was on no such path. It was the power of this quality of his life as a whole that enabled him to resist the woman's advances. Christians, we are accountable to the Lord, our Savior, our King, our Creator and Master, and some of us are accountable to our spouses, some of us accountable to our parents, we are accountable to our children, uh, to our friends, our extended families, to our church family, and that list could go on. And we have been called to love and serve all of these people for their good. Uh, So sins like this are never a small deal. Never just an isolated instance. And they're never a small deal. Uh, When people are in sin, we often are prone to want our sins to just be a small deal, to think that they aren't that hurtful, that there shouldn't be too many consequences. Uh, But sin always takes you farther than you want to go. We do not get to choose the amount or the severity of the consequences. And we do not get to decide who gets hurt and who doesn't nor do we get to decide how much it hurts them. When we remember all of this, when we are actively also then pursuing the relationships that God has given to us in righteous ways, striving to glorify him and truly loving the people God has gifted us the responsibility and the pleasure to love, when we're doing that, it's a whole lot easier to say no when temptations come our way. In other words, when you're busy loving the people you're supposed to love, serving the people you're supposed to serve, there's not much time left or any desire to be doing anything else. It's hard to fall into temptation when you are busy pursuing righteousness. It's hard to give in to selfish lust when you are busy giving out your love. Does that make sense? Verse 11. Verse 11. Uh, But one day, when he went into the house to do his work, to do his work, and none of the men of the house were, were there in the house, she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. She caught Joseph by surprise because he was busy doing his work like he was supposed to be doing. Uh, Realize, Joseph was not sitting in in the dining room twiddling his thumbs, wondering what he might do that day. He was busy doing his work. And then she caught him by his garment. And she was close, therefore, if she's got a hold of his garment, she's close. She's pulling him in, trying to seduce him, evidencing that she's obsessed. There must have been a struggle uh, for him to have to work his way out of that outer garment because she wouldn't let it go. So now was not the time for another conversation, was it? Uh, He ran. He fled. He got out of the house. Verse 13. And as soon as as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand, so you have an idea of how... um, heated up she is and the the way that she's thinking she's all flustered and she's grabbed this off of him and she realizes oh i have his cloak (laughs) when she realized he left his garment in her hand and and had fled out of the house she called to the men of her house and said to them see he has brought among us a hebrew to laugh at us He came in to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. So she's told them. And then she laid up his garment by her until 
his master came home. Who knows how long that was? But she's staging, set the stage, right? She lays the garment up by her until her master came home, and she told him the same story, saying, the Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came in to me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. Notice she didn't grab it off of him. He just left it there. So you see what she's done? If Joseph was, if Joseph was not going to give her what she wanted, he's going to have to suffer. She blames him and says that he was coming for her. And who else does she blame? Her husband. She blamed her husband. Kind of like uh, Adam saying to God, the woman whom you gave to be with me. Right? She blames her husband. She tells the servants, he, Potiphar, has brought among us a Hebrew. And she says to her husband, the Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us. She's saying, can you believe my husband brought this lesser life form, this terrible Hebrew, and let him live in our house? She wants to get Joseph in trouble. And in order to make sure her husband acts out against him, knowing how much respect Potiphar has for Joseph, she gets the rest of the house riled up against him and against Potiphar. She wants to put pressure on her husband to do something here. So now Potiphar's between a rock and a hard place. Verse 19. As soon as his master heard the, uh, the words of his wife that were spoken to him, this is the way your servant treated me. His anger was kindled. It burned. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. Uh, knowing what Potiphar's wife just did, and perhaps think, if Potiphar knew his wife well and really put Joseph in prison just to protect his own reputation in his house, you have to wonder exactly why his anger burned so hotly or against whom his anger burned. If Joseph was just a slave and if Potiphar believed he had tried to rape his wife, he could have just executed him. Potiphar was the captain of the guard. And Potiphar knew full well why his house had been so blessed ever since Joseph arrived. So I have to wonder who he was really angry with here. Uh, either way, uh, now for the second time in Joseph's life, he's been thrown into confinement unjustly. And his coat has been taken away from him and used to identify him in order to tell a story that is not true. This has happened before. And we don't, read, uh, we don't read much in this chapter about what his capture, his imprisonment looked like, but it couldn't have been pretty. Psalm, Psalm 105, 18 tells us that his feet were hurt with fetters, his neck was put in a collar of iron. So this wasn't a fun time for Joseph. Uh, but things would change quickly because, verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph. There's that phrase again. Whether as a slave in the house of an Egyptian or even in an Egyptian prison, the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love, covenanted, faithful, royal, or loyal, I'm sorry, loyal love, and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison, guess what he did? He put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge. That sounds like a bad um, professional idea, doesn't it? But that's what he did. He paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. Now the jailer knows that Joseph's God is pretty amazing. And whatever he did, whatever Joseph did, the Lord made it succeed. So for the second time now, a lot of things come in twos uh, for Joseph in his narrative. But for the second time, the person over Joseph is so blessed by the Lord's blessing of Joseph, by Joseph's faithful work, that he puts everything under Joseph's management. So Joseph the slave was a master of the house. Joseph the prisoner was a keeper in the prison because the Lord was with him. Uh, no matter where Joseph goes, God seems to be, to be preparing him for something bigger. Now, 
uh, as we finish up today, I want to encourage you in this way. First, let me remind you of the greatest commandments. Uh, Jesus gave these as the greatest commandments, Mark 12, 30 and 31. He said, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, with everything you are. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. And I said this earlier, I think it's worth saying again. It is hard to fall into temptation when you are busy pursuing righteousness. It is hard to give in to selfish lust when you are busy giving out your love. And so we want to look at our application today from, from two sides. It isn't just, don't sin. Stop. Stop sinning. If that's all you heard this morning, that'd be really frustrating, wouldn't it? Just stop it already. That's tough. Uh, don't commit adultery. Don't ever lie. If we're in the habit of lying, know this. We don't have victory over that by taking a vow of silence. We don't become mute for the rest of our lives to stop lying. That's not how that works. We have to start telling the truth. And the motivation for that change, because we don't just do that on a dime either. The motivation for that change is love. There has to be a change in our thinking. I am not the God of my life. Other people do not exist for my good pleasure. The Lord, he is God. And I have been put here by him for his glory, for his service. So we're never going to just stop sinning, stop committing adultery, stop lying. In order to stop, there has to be a change in our thinking, which results in a change in our actions. And when I think, I take the time to think about the love of God, the way that he loved me by sending his son to die in my place, to pay the penalty of my sin, to give me eternal life. We love because he first loved us. I take the time to think of the people in my life that he's called me to sacrifice myself for, to love them, to point them to him. Then, in that context, now I want to be busy. There's stuff to do. Loving the people God has given me to love. Serving the people whom God has given me to serve. Uh, whether that be at home, whether that be in the church, or in the workplace, which may operate with a totally different way, within a totally different construct in our homes, but then the church operates. Uh, so let me, let me just share this with you. Something that I'm going to try to do this week myself. I'm a task list guy. You guys like making lists for yourselves of things to do? Sometimes for a week, sometimes for a day, whatever the case may be. Uh, I have to write them all out. Uh, but sometimes, or maybe lots of times, that, that turns actions in my head, that those tasks just turn into stuff to do. Just stuff to do. And, and sometimes they look more annoying, right? When you have a task list and this, there's not enough check marks on there, it's like, oh, right? Sometimes you can even look at that task list and there's so much there to do that you just forfeit, right? Maybe you just read the news a little longer than you used to. Maybe you check the sports scores a little too many times. Uh, maybe you uh, get stuck on Facebook or Instagram or whatever longer than you would have wanted to because you're just overwhelmed by it. Remember, when we're busy loving other people, that's when we're at our strongest. Okay, so let's try this. If this sounds like a good idea to you, try it with me. We're going to write out our list of things to do for the week, uh, but, but next to those things to do, let's write... Who am I serving here? Who am I doing this for? How, how does this, uh, when I do this task, uh, this is for my wife. When I do this, I'm loving my kids here. Th this is for my boss to help him or her. This is for my coworkers. This is, this is for my employees so I can provide them with what they need to do their job the best they can. 
Of course, all of it, all of it is in service to Jesus Christ. That's why we do everything we do, whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we do it to the glory of God, okay? That certainly includes what we're doing from nine to five. Um, there are people, there are people who need us to be giving our all. And in truth, everything we do is for the glory of God. And so I'd hope uh, that most of us or all of us, we'd be able to go through a week without having to endure the same temptation that Joseph did in this message, in this passage. But how often can we be tempted to be lazy or to busy ourselves with unimportant things when we should be doing something else? Uh, Whatever the temptation might be, whatever temptation that may come along, we can, this is great news, we can, by God's grace, overcome that temptation all the more easily when we are busy loving and serving others. So Christians, let's get after that. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the fact that we, um, we come before you uh, <laughs> I just think of Romans 5.8. While we were yet sinners, you commended your love to us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You loved us at our worst and, and you have brought us into your kingdom, into your family, into this eternal inheritance in Christ, not because of anything that we bring to the table, but because you chose uh, to pour your love out on us and to make us become something we're not. Thank you for your grace. I pray that we would remember this. These gospel truths are so important, uh, not just to know that we're going to go to heaven when we die, although that is incredibly important, Lord, those, those truths also help us to overcome temptation. To know who we are, to know our weaknesses, to know what we were saved to do, saved to become. And so God, I pray that we would be a people who don't operate the same way the world does. May we not live for ease. May we not uh, live and work just so that we can stop having to. But Lord, may we look at the things that we do 24-7. When we wake up in the morning and head to the office tomorrow morning, may we, may we do it with an eagerness to go and shine the light of Christ with the things that we say and the things that we do. Uh, when the kids head to school in the morning, to remember that it's not just a terrible test that they have to take, but an opportunity to be a Christian in what might be a dark place. Uh, even for kiddos who, who might be in a Christian school or a home school. Uh, everybody around us needs us to give our very best, to do it with a sincere heart, to follow hard after Jesus. And God, we are all going to fall short in that. We're going to mess up. Or there's going to be times that our motives are all, all out of whack, times that we are discouraged, or where we don't feel like doing anything hard. God, we thank you for what Jesus was willing to endure, that when he knew the very hardest thing was about to come, he said, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. And we pray that you'd help us. Lord, forgive us where we have fallen short. Help us to push on ahead in the grace of Jesus to keep on doing what you've called us to do. And God, we pray that in doing that, uh, you would be glorified, that we would see the fruit and the evidence, the joy in our life as a result of following hard after you that it would be a blessing not just to us, but to the people around us who you've called us to serve. Lord, we pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing.